Welcome to the first episode of Series 21, everyone. Today we are welcoming Daniel Kwan and Patrick Keenan, designers of the upcoming game Ross Rifles, which is both kickstarting right now and already funded with four stretch goals unlocked as of the time I am recording this. This game is something very special and super important, so definitely check it out if you haven't already. We'll actually be diving into this game starting this series, but before we get to that, some quick announcements. When this episode releases, a Catacon signups will be live for VIPs, which means you'll be able to start signing up for really cool events that we have going on this year. Amelia is running a Garbage of the Five Rains panel on Friday. I'm running two games of Chimera and one of my latest games, which is highly experimental, uh, but it should be a really good time. Uh, also, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Amelia and I will be running a character creation cast panel that features some great audience participation as we randomly create some characters together and decide what sort of world these characters could inhabit and what sorts of zany adventures they could go on. It is sure to be a really good time, so check that out as well. Last up, we are super thankful to everyone who left us a review during our review drive in the last few weeks. It meant the world to us. Definitely keep those reviews coming, though, because we absolutely love hearing from you, and they really do help the show out a lot in the rankings, which helps us out a lot as well. It makes us feel really, really, really good. So definitely get to those links in the show notes and, and leave us some reviews. That's all I have for these announcements, so I am going to give my sick voice a rest and let you all get to some really great content coming up this episode. So, let's get on with the show. Enjoy! Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia. In this episode, my co-host Ryan and I are thrilled to welcome Daniel Kwan and Patrick Keenan, designers for Ross Rifles, a World War I powered by the Apocalypse RPG. The game we'll be covering this series and is kickstarting this month. Yeah, welcome to Character Creation Cast, both of you. We are really excited that you could join us. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. Let's start by introducing you to our audience. Daniel, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any other projects you're currently involved in? Yeah, so I'm Daniel Kwan. I am the co-host of the Asians Represent podcast. Patrick and myself and another Daniel. Oh. We're, we're Dundas <laughs> West Games. Um well, we'll get more into Ross Rifles later, but more about me. Yeah, co-host Asians Represent. Uh, I am the co-founder and lead facilitator of Level Up Gaming. We're an organization in Toronto that helps adults with autism and other disabilities uh, develop their social skills through group gaming experiences. And I am a freelance writer and sensitivity reader. Right now, I'm working on Haunted West. That's uh, Chris Spivey's follow-up to Harlem Unbound. Uh, what else am I working on? Ooh, oh, and I'm working on something for Wizards of the Coast. But yeah, oh. that's it. Ooh. Ooh. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and what about yourself, Patrick? Um, I'm Patrick. I'm uh, the other half of the writing team at Dundas West Games. I'm also the publishing coordinator. Um, uh, outside of RPGs, I'm a student at the University of Toronto, and I study history and archaeology, um, particularly uh, 19th and 20th century European history, which is where Ross Rifles comes in. Um, nice. and I also run the Royal Ontario Museum Dungeons and Dragons program for teenagers, um, where we they just come in, it's an educational program, we play D&D, &D and I teach them about topics from history and archaeology as well. Um, in archaeology, I do field work in the Republic of Georgia, the former Soviet oh. Union, Soviet Republic, so that's fun, yeah. Wow. 
I'm also a retired archaeologist. <laughs> I was going to say, how is that how you, <laughs> how you two know each other? We yeah. know each other from the ROM from the museum. I used to be the teacher for the program that Patrick teaches. Yeah. Oh, wow. I worked You've for Daniel replaced. for a long time, and now <laughs> and, and yeah. we hand, hand off. <laughs> <laughs> this year was the handoff year. Yeah. Awesome. Con up continuity. <laughs> Wait, is Dundas West Games just running the ROM D&D as well? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get into this, um, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? Since this is a new game, can you give us a quick pitch for it? Um, the genre, the setting, etc.? Yeah. Uh, Ross Rifles is, like you said, a PBTA hack. Uh, it's powered by the Apocalypse game, set in the Canadian trenches of the First World War. So it's all about the bond, the relationship, and the tension between members of a section, like a squad of soldiers, living in the Western Front, living inside a trench. Hmm. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that covers yeah, it. That's like really our well. elevator yeah. pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we know it's uh, powered by the Apocalypse. Is there anything that we need for this game outside of the, the standard 2D6? Um, tokens. Just tokens. Yeah, yeah that's just it. tokens. It could be anything. Gla glass beads, Smarties, coins. Coins. Yeah. Coin, you can do just, really old coins if you want to be on yeah. theme. Oh, that'd be uh -oh. cool. Uh, yeah, you just need tokens to represent morale. Okay. Do you get Very to cool. eat them if you use Smarties or M&Ms? You could, actually, because, you, well, you're passing them to another person. So, <laughs> oh, so okay. you're sharing your snacks, and you only get to eat them if somebody shares one with <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if as morale goes down, you can, like, eat them. Well, or... <laughs> actually, if you want to help somebody and you're giving them a morale token and they eat it, you're actually... Yeah, I mean, that actually is on theme. That works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <That's amazing>. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that with old coins, though. No, oh, no, no don't eat old <laughs> coins. <laughs> That's the important part for everyone to take away from this episode. Don't eat old coins. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of stories and themes was this game meant to explore? Um, so based on the setting, uh, the Western Front of the First World War, and especially the Canadian perspective, um, I think that the largest theme that we explore in the game is camaraderie. Um, you know, the soldiers in the trenches growing to support each other, help each other get through such an awful situation. Um, and that's kind of the story that we really wanted to tell when we sat down to play this game. Um, and also remembrance. So a big tenant in Canada and Canadian history is remembering the soldiers who fought in the First World War. And I like to think that if we're playing the game, um, putting ourselves into their lives, into their shoes, that that's a pretty powerful way to remember their sacrifice. Mm hmm. Do you have anything to say, Daniel? How can I follow that up? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to ask, you're both Canadian, so that's, I'm sure, where a lot of the heavy focus on the Canadian part of this comes from. But, like, is there something specific to that Canadian experience outside of just your ties with it that felt important to explore? No, I think, I mean, aside from our ties, like, Patrick, you have familial ties. Yes, Daniel I have has familial ties, ties to so the war. Daniel, yeah. Um, and... I think for us, it's like we're Canadian. We You don't see a lot of... A big one was... Okay, when we started the project, I was still teaching at the ROM. And we were we had been working on a D&D &D campaign setting that we wanted to publish. And we were like, oh, we got to put this on Kickstarter. And then we all said, well, nobody knows who we are in the game design world. Mm -hmm. Like some people knew about me from the ROM at the time. And I was like, okay, well, we, we got to do something small then to put us on the map. And then so we had, we were like, well, let's just do like a World War One thing because uh, it was like the summer. It was August 2017. Yeah, we were coming up on the 100th anniversary of um, some date, I think. Yeah, well, I don't we, remember specifically which one. Well, we had Remembrance Day coming up and I was like, <laughs> yeah. well, we were using Night Witches in the course to help teach mm -hmm. kids about World War Two. And we were like, well, what if we just made a small game about World War One? Well, we'll do a quick Kickstarter. People will know about us. And then we'll do our D&D &D thing. And then we announced it and then it just blew up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's like a mythology of the First World War in Canadian public consciousness that really was taken off from this. Like, I think a lot of Canadians, especially like um, when you're going up in school, you learn about like the Canadian experience in the First World War. But I always found it to be a bit dis dissatisfactory because you never learn about people. You just learn about events. And so that's yeah. what I think we were using this game as a tool for. Yeah. And I think a big theme was also like diversity. Like, yeah. I don't have a familial, not that I know of, I don't have a familial connection to the war. Uh, I had learned about the war in high school and all that. But on my old podcast, Curiosity and Focus, I did an episode where I kind of dove into the recently unknown history of this soldier named Frederick Lee. And he was one of the 
as far as I know, he is the first known Canadian-born Chinese person to fight and die in World War I. Oh, wow. And I didn't even know Chinese people fought in the war until this year, ba- oh, two years ago, mm-hmm. not until this year. <laughs> That'd be really sad. <laughs> no, until two, when we started working on the project, I didn't know Chinese people even fought in the war. And after I did that podcast, I started diving into it and I learned about the diversity of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which is for me a, a big thing that we want to highlight with the game and a big thing that makes it a Canadian game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Yeah, I think that's something that we don't even now get a lot of history of here in the u.s is world war one I. I feel like there's a mm-hmm. i remember a lot of focus on world war Two. yeah um but like next to nothing on world war one mm-hmm. yeah pretty much um it, it it seems to be something that got superseded by world war Two here in the states yeah yeah, yeah. it makes sense i think in canada it's largely tied to like an idea of emerging as a country on the national stage which is like mm-hmm. kind of okay. what we're taught about um so i guess that's why it's more widely remembered. Yeah, and Canadian soldiers were also really well known from World War One for being outstanding yeah. combatants. Hmm, very cool. So what do characters exactly do in Ross Rifles then? Um, aside from, so you have your, your standard military duties, you have your standing two, waiting for the Germans to come at you, and they'll, they'll never come at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have your, you know, your adventures, I will say adventures with air quotes. Uh, into no man's land it could be to rescue people capture germans it could be to attempt a full-on charge destroy defenses all sorts of different military yeah. stuff to yeah. do yeah and then there then there's the the more lighthearted approach to it there there's the time you spend in your dugout just hanging out reminiscing about time you know, like your time at home mm. uh reflecting on the soldiers that you lost um and trying to sort of keep your humanity and make sure that all of you make it out of the war alive and how the war affects you. So there's both the, there's both the military aspect of it where you're like Patrick said, doing military things. Yeah. You're like capturing objectives, destroying things, trying to make sure people get out alive, uh, gathering intelligence, going on sort of espionage. And then there's like the human side where it's just five of you sitting together in the trench, trying to make sure that all of you go home. And then the third part, and the, the recent thing we've kind of been exploring at conventions is the lighter side of the First World War with like the mascots. Yeah, like um, certain battalions would have certain mascots, like the the 10th Battalion had like a beaver or something. And oh. there are a lot of jokes, practical jokes and stuff. So we wanted to add that into the, the third dimension of the game to, you know, so it's not all dark and gritty all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had uh, at Breakout Con two years ago, I did a play test where they didn't even want to do battle. And all they did was they they waited until they were sent to the reserve trench, and then they had time off. So they went to a we did a whole play test where they went to a farmhouse <laughs> to steal cheese and wine, <laughs> and that was just the whole thing. That's I love amazing. games that can do that kind of balance, though. That like you can have those because I really like the games that explore those really heavy emotional things. But sometimes that's so much that it feels really good to have that little bit of like lighter part of it too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, there was there was a playtest where we had a younger, like a younger participant who was playing one of the playbooks called the Scrounger, and his whole thing was that he was trying to make a robot. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure we'll we'll get into the playbooks, but the uh, the Scrounger actually uh, has a project that they're working on, and it doesn't say what the project has to be. Most people do like, oh, I'm working on a water purifier, and it's made out of all these big shells, and there's layers of scraps of cloth that filters the rainwater for us mm-hmm. but this one kid was like i'm, I'm trying to make a robot <laughs> <laughs> and so we're like okay what does a world war one robot look like and he's like it's like a small tank <laughs> <laughs> like an rc car oh, oh, amazing. and so their whole session was about trying to get parts for it that's oh, so that's cool awesome. <laughs> So what do you feel is unique about this game? Obviously, it uses the Powered by the Apocalypse system, um, which a lot of games do, but it sounds like you've kind of changed that a lot to make it fit telling these kinds of stories. And I'm interested in hearing what you guys think you've done to really make it stand out. I think it's... So if you if you look at all the World War One tabletop RPGs out there, most of them, if not all of them, involve the occult in some way. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, if you look at, I mean, there was, there were a couple of recent ones on Kickstarter and most of them involve the occult. Sort of that, the fear, the dread, the danger associated with No Man's Land is often reduced to the supernatural in yeah. a lot of games. And we really wanted to take 
a a full on gritty approach to the war. Yeah, I think we really wanted to strive for that realism aspect and portray a, um, a sort of more realistic view of the war and also uh, showcase that you don't really need to talk about the occult or the supernatural in order to display how horrific the first world war was. Um, it's quite the, you know, terrible time. And so I think that's what we were really going for as well to sort of showcase the sacrifice of these soldiers. Yeah. And one of the things we really wanted was um, I really like dungeon world as a PBTA game, but I also love games like, you know, like night witches, which is super historic. And Night oh, Witches yeah. really focuses on the drama on the air base and less of an emphasis on, you know, the flying and the aerial combat. Mm-hmm. And yeah. whereas Dungeon World has deep, deep combat, but less built in structure for role playing. So we kind of wanted both. We wanted to have an equal mix of drama, narrative, but also combat because, you know, this is the First World War. Yeah. And we like games that have combat in them as yeah. well. So, yeah, we wanted good combat in our game. Very cool. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the history of the game. Um, we know that it is brand new. Um, we heard a little bit of where this idea came from and why you wanted to make this game. So were there specific feelings that you were wishing to provoke uh, with what Ross Rifles while playing the game? Um, I'd say certainly... Well, you said remembrance. Remembrance is a big one. Um, in terms of what you feel as you're a player in the game, I think dread is one. Yeah. Um, you want to feel, you know, how terrible the combat is of the war, but you also want to feel the camaraderie and the bravery of soldiers, the um, the morale that is given to you by role playing with these other people at the table and experiencing um, just a small group of people in the war. Yeah, I, I think an, another thing with the with the war is that so many soldiers who fought in the First World War. I mean, a big takeaway from it was how futile everything was. Yeah. They're like, why are we here? Mm-hmm. What are we fi- What are we fighting for at this point? And one of the things we wanted to capture in the war was you can, you can have these huge successful achievements as a group of players, mm-hmm. but ultimately what you're going to be doing won't have an impact on the war. This is not about creating alternate history. It's about creating your own history within history. So we really wanted to capture that. Our early, in early in development, we focused on how deadly the war was. But then the game was too deadly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we kind of took a step back. We, it's changed significantly since uh, in, the, in the past two years. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so you probably got a lot of uh, good play testing feedback about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like huge. So Daniel and I went to, uh, so Daniel Grow, our, he's kind of like he manages all of the business. Mm-hmm. We would not be this far without Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have that one person always who's like, no, let's focus though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. We, the three of us balance each other out very well. We've also been friends for like a long time, of, like yeah. decade. I've known Daniel for over a decade. Yeah. I've known you for eight, close to eight a, years. Yeah. Close to yeah. a decade. And we actually, so Daniel and I drove to Metatopia in 2018 with the intention of being like, hey, we were just about to release this ash cam where it's going to go on Kickstarter. We had we had basically finished the book. The book's been done for yeah. about a year. And we went and did some really successful play tests. And then Mark Diaz Truman of Magpie Games was like, okay, here's where it has to change if you want it to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. on, on the drive back from Metatopia, I was like furiously like, shouting ideas at daniel and daniel was furiously typing them into our text co- or like our facebook messenger conversation with patrick <laughs> and so we basically rewrote the vast majority of the playbooks of the system on a 10-hour drive back yeah oh my oh, and we got so into it that we actually got pulled over several times by the police for speeding <laughs> oh no <laughs> and i don't know if it, uh, patrick knows this yeah but the first time we got pulled over the police officer came and was like hey you guys know how fast we were going? I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, we're just trying to get home. We were just at a gaming convention. And I started, like, stammering. And the officer looks at Daniel. And Daniel was wearing a poppy on his jacket. And, like, a big World War One symbol. And he was like, what's that? Daniel's like, oh, this is just, a, you know, this is a symbol that we were in Canada to honor veterans. And the officer was like, oh, I'm a veteran. And we were like, we were actually playtesting our game, which is about the, the First World War. And he's like, oh, that's super cool. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. The other times were were less interesting. Most of them involved me being like, I really have to go to the bathroom. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not from here. A lot of, a lot of I'm that. I'm Canadian. Yeah. A lot of that. Uh, I don't know miles per hour. I don't know why. Right. Yeah, like the we dial is smaller on the know. inside of my speedometer. I'm, I have, we have too many ideas. <laughs> um, but just to get back to playtesting, um, we also did a lot of playtesting with the military community in Canada. Um, we mm. organized a, an event at the Moss Park Armory in Toronto, and um, we played with a bunch of people there who were very interested in our game. Yeah, a whole bunch um, of them were Afghanistan veterans. Yeah, and they... They gave us a lot of good feedback as well on how to present a more accurate military story. So yeah, we're gonna nice. we're going back to them for a uh, a stretch goal yeah. of ours. Yeah. Oh, nice. Actually, I think oh, almost cool. all of those soldiers were medics. They were all. Yeah, medics. they were all yeah. medics. We're, oh, wow. one of our stretch goals is uh, a medic, like a Canadian Army Medical Corps uh, character. Playbook. Yeah. But we need to talk to them about yeah. doing it justice. We also did a lot of playtesting with families like a significant amount of playtesting has been with young people yeah like the first ever playtest we did outside of the three of us kind of like mock playing was mm -hmm. with at the time my students at the rom mm -hmm. and it was on november 11th and we actually took them to a world war one memorial that's near the museum and we talked about the war patrick talked about the war and your family yeah and then we came back and then we all played ross rifles for the very first time and we kind of told taught all of the staff how to play it we were like, let's just do Vimy Ridge. Mm -hmm. And we played Ross Rifles for the very first time, I guess, in public with like 50 people all under wow. the age of 15. Yep. Oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, that was our first play test. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the educational uh, mission behind this game as yeah. well. And our, right? our second play test was in Ottawa. Yeah. At the, well, after, well, we went to the War Museum. Yeah. And then we did a lot of research. Yeah. A ton of research. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, that seems to be a thing that you've taken very seriously here is making sure that um, not only is the like portrayal at least somewhat accurate, but that it like feels correct, like that you have the feeling correct too. Yeah, so I think there's a tendency to want like the mechanics and like the story around the game to feel like or to be accurate. You know, like the things that you put in the book and the backgrounds and things should be accurate. But I think it's, it feels like you are you're trying to make what you do at the table feel correct too. Yeah, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that, I mean, a good chunk, a lot of people have been asking, so I've done like three other podcasts um, talking about Ross Rifles, and almost every time people have asked the question of, the quick start is so comprehensive, what's the book going to have? And a, bit, <laughs> and a big chunk of the book is actually history. Yeah. Big chunk of it is history. We've worked really hard to you know, write a good, inclusive history of the First World War, but mm -hmm. also write a history of uh, the Ross rifle itself. That's something that like, I know a lot of Americans don't know about unless you're like a firearm enthusiast. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went to Ottawa for our second play test, we actually spent like a good four hours in the armory of the Canadian war museum. Yeah. Just looking at Ross rifles and other. Yeah. Cause there's like stuff. 30 variants of the rifle. And mm -hmm. we were looking at uh, the big one that stood out for me was those, uh, the bracelets. Yeah. Yeah. But well, we can get to that for uh, character creation. Very cool. Are there any basic terms or concepts you feel like people need to know before we actually jump into our character creation? Things that people need to have an understanding of to follow along with us? Yeah. So we have uh, attributes, harm, and stress. Do you want to start with attributes? Yeah. So the attributes, um, they're your basic uh, uh, stats that you have as a character. Um, you know, it's pretty standard for PBTA. You have four of, uh, four of them. Um, and so the four that we've gone with are Valor. I, Wit, and Brawn. Um, valor would represent your character's bravery, um, you know, ability to stand up in the face of danger on the battlefield. Your eye is your ability to see things, spot things, shoot. Um, wit would be your quick thinking on the battlefield, able to get into cover quickly. And then your Brawn is just your physical strength. And um, depending on your playbook, you would assign a score ranging from minus one to two for those attributes. And then you get to add one as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. To anyone you want. And then we, we have sort of two health tracks. So a big part of First World War was this idea of in, in the history books, you see shell shock. Mm -hmm. But soldiers talk about war neuroses and psychologists talk about war neuroses. And how the effects of the war had a profound psychological toll on the soldiers. So we have something called stress in the game. And stress represents basically psychological damage and how experiencing the war itself has an effect on the human and mm. so 
there are two tracks, one for stress and then one for physical harm. That's like physical damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, physical harm has four checkboxes. If you check off all four, you're dead and your character is out of the narrative. Uh, stress has six checkboxes. If you check off all six, you actually are also out of the narrative because your character might be rendered catatonic mm-hmm. um, and might suffer from any of the effects of, excuse me, shell shock or war neuroses, which are outlined in the mm-hmm. book. But I think what, what makes it interesting is that as you accumulate stress, it has an effect on your character's mechanics. So, for instance, yeah. you get like a minus one to an attribute or another minus one to an attribute. Or if it even, even escalates to the point where your seven to nine rolls, for those of you who are familiar with PBTA, uh, count as failures. Yeah. So, Oof. Wow. the stress mechanics and how how little harm you can take really force all of the players to lean on each other for support. Yeah. Especially for stress removal and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. That is mm-hmm. a big... I was going to say, I assume there are then a lot of mechanics that involve like adjusting that for that stress Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah there's some playbooks that are very very good at it yeah uh, play like playbooks like the scarred have a lot of moves that would allow you to remove stress from yourself or other players yep the creative is like a morale character yeah yeah cool very cool yeah so those are the three ones and i think if that's for character creation and then for you know actual playing there's a, a thing called ground uh ground is our sort of narrative tool for combat Mm-hmm. So we we didn't want combat to be resolved in like two dice rolls. We wanted combat to feel dyna- as dynamic as the GM and the player wants it to be. Yeah. But we wanted mm-hmm. to have that flexibility. And ground is kind of there to represent your narrative momentum towards your objective. Uh, okay. And ground is something that you use when you are in like open combat. If the enemy is actively shooting back at you, you are you're going and you're your recording ground. So yeah, that's something that that's also worthwhile. It's worth noting, especially since some of the moves involve ground. Very cool. All right. Uh, is there anything else before we hop into character creation? I think that's it. That's all I think. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm so excited for this. Yeah. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Okay. So usually we let our guests pick first. Um, if you guys have playbooks that you particularly want to try out. Mm hmm. Oh, man. No. I, are you sure you want us to pick first? What about you? Well, I mean, we can if you want. We just always give you the option since you're the guest. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll let, we'll let <laughs> well, you two yeah, pick. You guys can pick first. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do you um do you at all want to run kind of run through, give us like a quick um yeah. idea of what, like one or two sentences of what each of these playbooks is? So there's six of them. Uh, I guess we can alternate, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. So the sergeant is the first one. The sergeant is someone who kind of bears the responsibility of the section, the group's actions. So if the group messes up or, you know, does something that can get them, you know, in hot water with high command, the sergeant is somebody who bears that responsibility and takes that on their shoulders. The sergeant is also like the leader. The sergeant can rally everybody together. Yep. Um, Then there's the creative. So the creative is someone who, um, before the war, uh, engaged in some sort of art. They maybe were a writer or a painter, and they found themselves on the battlefield for whatever reason. Maybe they volunteered, maybe they were enlisted, and they're just trying to use their artistic abilities to um, assist the war effort in any way. So by creating art and looking at the battlefield in a different way, you can raise morale for the rest of the section or relieve stress, things like that. Yeah, and the creative is also somebody who's kind of holding on to who they were before yeah. the war. And also you can play it like... The creative is basically J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes, that's the big inspiration that we... Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, each playbook is inspired by somebody in history. So, like, the sergeant, for me, when we were working on it, is Masumi Mitsui, who is probably the most famous Japanese-Canadian to fight in the war, Mm -hmm. and was a sergeant, commanded, like, 30 men. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, So, after the creative is the scrounger. The scrounger is somebody who's good at getting stuff. The, The scrounger can get supplies from, you know, the quartermaster. The scrounger is also very talented at making things from garbage. Uh, basically, turning the inhospitable trenches into home is the scrounger's job. Yeah. Um, after the scrounger, we have the replacement. The replacement is someone who's fresh out of training. Um, they've just been sent to the section. Um, and they're, the idea is that they're replacing someone else who the section lost. Um, and they really are more open-ended. Um, their story has just begun, as we say, but yeah. a lot of their moves are also related to stress removal and things like that, reminding the rest of the section of home. Yeah, they're, they're they're like the outsider in the section. Yeah. But them being an outsider it is also a way for them to remember who, th- like, who they were, what they've become, 
and that replacement character has that really fresh perspective. Yeah. I like the replacement because you could be like, you could play a coward who just doesn't want to be on this, this section. Or it could be somebody who's like, look, I want to prove myself. I know you lost, you know, the person who I'm replacing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not trying to be them, but I am trying to be a part of this group. Yeah. It's very open-ended. Very open-ended. There's the scarred. And that's somebody who, who had a, you know, a hard life before the war. Maybe they actually fought in the second South African war, which was Canada's like first international conflict for the British. Maybe they they were a veteran of that war and they came into the war already uh, jaded or physically scarred or you know uh they they had a life before the war that kind of caused them to withdraw from sort of authority and the scarred is somebody who basically bears the responsibility of making sure everybody gets out alive so while the sergeant is all about duty and responsibility to you know the military the scarred is all about responsibility to the section that small group of people Hmm. This guard's like the adult of the group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we have the scout. So the scout is a bit of a lone wolf type character, I guess. Um, they're more effective at combat than the other characters, but, um, you know, they, they're kind of viewed as the, the person who takes charge on leading the group into the combat besides the sergeant or covering them as they leave type thing. Um, and the interesting thing about the scout is that you can play... Um, the scout as a bit of a, a sniper type class or as a, someone who runs in, charges in and gets up close and personal with all their enemies as well. Uh, stormtrooper type. Yeah. Not like the Star Wars stormtrooper. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> People have no, asked hopefully before. they can like yeah. actually like hit something. Yeah. Yeah. Like during <laughs> during the war, the Canadians had a, a, a very, very notorious I guess reputation for being excellent shock troopers and yeah, uh, we were the, called stormtroopers. The, the Germans, Germans called them stormtroopers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. If there was one right, war Ryan. where we were awesome, it was the First World War. <laughs> 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 um, Ryan, I, do you have a thought on what I, you want to do? I do have my eye on one of them, uh, uh-huh. for sure. Uh, the creative. I knew it. <laughs> I know. Good choice. I'm so Good choice. That's Patrick's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Amelia? That one sounds sweet. That's going to be Ryan. I know. Um, I uh, was thinking I would like to do The Replacement. Oh, I love that one. That's your favorite. That's my favorite. (laughs) (laughs) What did you get for not picking first? I actually based The Replacement on another game designer when we were were rewriting it in that car. Yeah. Oh. Do, do, Do you folks know Todd Crapper? No. I've heard of him. Yeah. He wrote uh, High Plains Samurai. He, he's, a, he's another uh, designer based in Ottawa, but at Metatopia, he played a cowardly character and all he did was he stuck in this one crater in the middle of no man's land and the sergeant who was played by, oh, I think it was, it was DC, mm-hmm. uh, oh. was trying to get him to go and he was like, let's go. And I was like, no, I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, we have to make a playbook that can accommodate that narrative, mm-hmm. that, that innocence. That's awesome. I really like the the attribute uh, spread for the the replacement as well. All yeah. zeros. All yeah, zeros. It's, it's easy. <laughs> it's it's super easy, and then you get to add one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you, what do you think of that, Patrick? Um, I'll take the scrounger since it's right here in front of me. You gonna go scrounger? Yeah. Okay. There's your pencil. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know what? I guess the even out because we have a whole bunch of like role playing characters. I'll go for the scout. Okay. Yeah, I'll do the scout. I mean, the beauty of this show is that we don't have to ever balance anything because we never have to play these characters. <laughs> so we can make all the worst role-playing decisions knowing that we never have to follow through on Oh, I'm just going to be mm-hmm. all wit. And I'm going to be really <laughs> bad at using my gun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for character creation, uh, what do you both have your playbooks in front of you? Yes. Yes. Okay, so for character creation, on the first page, you always start on the left hand side so the description and your equipment so when you're doing your description there's a little bit of information that that's kind of a narrative prompt to help you figure out who your playbook is going to be so who your scout's going to be who your scrounger is going to be your replacement or your creative uh you're going to pick a uniform your appearance and your name and play your character's name and player name now big thing with ross rifles two big things for character creation right off the bat is the first one you there is you have no obligation to be a white person in Ross Rifles. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be a man in Ross Rifles as well. A lot of people ask, like, oh, do I have to be a dude? And I'm like, no, 100% not. Uh, there was an entire women's battalion of death. That's not a Canadian battalion. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the Eastern Front. Yeah, but it did exist. So. But it did exist. They were kind of like the Night Witches before the Night Witches, and they fought in trenches. Uh, then, I mean, the, a big theme was like, you, you don't change the ultimate, you know, flow of the war. Mm-hmm. You have big impact for the people around you. And since we're doing these sort of sort of alternate histories within one part of the trench, you could be whoever you want. And there were like hundreds of thousands of soldiers who fought for the Canadian military. Yeah. Who's to say like somebody didn't go. Anybody can be there. So, you know, when you're when you're designing a game, there are times when you try to lean on historical accuracy. And then there are times when you just say you just throw historical accuracy out the out the out the window. Mm -hmm. And for gender, that's the one we did. You can be whoever you want. That's awesome. And then, so once you have your description, you'll see under equipment. So uh, equipment is preset because when you actually inflict harm upon an enemy and you succeed, you kill them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, medicine. <laughs> the equipment doesn't have an actual mechanic effect, um, really, except for the grenades, I guess. But and the personal item. And the personal item, but it's more of a narrative tool to for you to imagine who your character is, what you have, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so for instance, the scout, I have uh, a Ross Rifle Mark III with a 1913 telescopic sight. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me indicates like, I, I am a sniper. The Ross Rifle was a fantastic sharpshooter's weapon, but a very, very poor uh, sort of infantry weapon. That's what it's known for in Canada. When you learn about the Ross Rifle, you learn about how terrible it was. They say it took like five five soldiers to operate one Ross Rifle. It was always getting clogged with mud. And of oh, course, wow. there was lots of mud on the Western yeah. Front. It was too yeah. long to use in a trench. Do you remember when we held them? Yeah. They were big. Oh, no. They're huge. Yeah. And it was designed for hunting. And it was like a sportsman's rifle. You could like, there's a variant where you could shoot it with your, like lying on your back. Yeah. That was weird. Um, but it was like, it was an excellent sharpshooter's gun. But you needed perfect ammunition. Uh, you couldn't have ammunition that was like, mass produced and banged up we had to take real good care of it and we actually learned when we went to the museum that you could assemble the bolt backwards yeah so that when you fired it it, sh- it shot it would, your face yeah, it blow up essentially yeah <laughs> so, oh, so this is like completely in ideal for this situation so it like yeah it wasn't ideal for most soldiers but for the scout it is ideal because it was more accurate than the lee enfield rifle that the ross Rif- rifle was replaced with Mm-hmm. So we've kind of sprinkled in that history here. And then tools uh, and other are actually things that you would be carrying with you. So this is reference. And, the okay. last and I think, yeah, most effort. playbooks have different tools yep. so that they can fulfill different roles as well. And not everyone can do everything, right? So you have to, it forces you to work together to cooperate. Yeah, 100%. And then the personal item is something that you have from home, something that isn't standard issue. And that's something you write in. It could be like, people have done like, like dirty postcards. Yeah. Like not like muddy dirty, but like, you know, adult postcards. People have done like <laughs> Bibles, uh, like pocket watches, lockets, chocolate, bacon. Yeah. I think a big one is just pictures of your family from home. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. So while we're making our characters, we'll start with the left side because that's very much that sets the tone for the rest of it. Yeah. I'm going to have. Um, hmm. The scout, and it also a lot of it also depends on the conversation that you have before you even start. Like when, when in the war do we want this to take place? Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. If we were doing it at the very beginning, maybe I'm well kept. Yeah, but if you're at the end, you know, you're probably not getting the freshest looking uniform. Right. Yeah. It'll be dirty, ill fitting. I'm gonna pick stained for me because I want to be a sniper. I picked ill fitting as my uniform because <laughs> my, my backstory will be will tell end of this. How, how about you two? I chose fresh. For my uniform, nice. I picked fresh and ill-fitting. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a good one. Even though it's a circle one, do do whatever you'd like. I I'm already doing it wrong. No, this, this, <laughs> it's not wrong. This is my show. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's not. There's nothing. No, no, like, no wrong. It, yeah, I feel like coming in like as a replacement, coming in a little bit later, like it's a new uniform, but also probably not like you know for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my player name is obviously Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can handle that one. Yeah, the player name's the easy one. And then one of the things we were talking about before the recording was actually using 
the Canadian war records. Yeah. And so actually right now I am looking at my own great grandfather's uh, testament paper and I'm going to try to see what I can get out of that for this character. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you could actually go to this for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you let me let me get you the what what to go. Yeah. If you just Google Canadian war records, you could find uh, search personnel records of the First World War. And you could try searching like if you just search for a given name, Robert, you see the thousands yeah. of Roberts. <laughs> or like, you know what? I wonder if there's a Chang. Search database. I'm going to search oh, it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, oh, no Changs. Oh, wow. Oh. What about, what about Chang? Yeah. So you could, oh, this you... is what we went through in the beginning. And I actually have a no, no Changs either. Dang. It'd be nice if they had like a, a random. Oh, a, rand a randomizer. Yeah. That'd be pretty sweet. Wonder if we should just oh, make a section there's... of our website and just put like a random name generator for World War One. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. Personal records of the First World War. Antrim. R. Hmm. Is is there one? Is there an Antrim? There is an Antrim. No hmm. way. Hmm. Cool. Yep. All right, now I gotta look. Yeah, you have to look, right? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> there's only one, and it does not have a full first name. It's just R. Uh, do you, can you see but... the papers? Um, no. Oh, Zero it's a mystery. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the, the papers yeah, show, non -permanent show a lot. Non-permanent active militia. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Mitsui. Oh, there's bolters without ease, though. Ooh. Hmm. This is very exciting. Yeah, it's, it's super cool just seeing because if you, if you actually look at their papers, you can, you can see like where they're from, their next of kin, their address. And actually what's really cool is like what they did before the war. Their, their, their trade or calling is actually there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this actually, you know, kind of leads into the middle of the character sheet. Uh, if you finish, you know, your description, your personal item, there are some questions. Mm. Uh, I didn't know because so uh, Masumi Mitsui, who was, a, who was a sergeant in the war, his like grandfather was a samurai and he lived in Canada. He was born in Japan. And he was probably, he's like I said earlier, he's the most decorated Japanese Canadian to fight in the war. Yep. And I did not know that before the war, he was a waiter. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. He was a waiter. And he consented to being wow. vaccinated. Oh. <laughs> that is one of the questions. This is interesting. My, uh, there is a Thomas Bolter whose birthday is two days before my birthday. Uh, obviously, what? centuries prior. Um <laughs> And uh, their wife was named Mary, which is my mom's name. Dang. Whoa. Yeah, there's lots of people with my mom's maiden name in here. They actually. were a bridge builder. Cool. There's a lieutenant. Thomas Frederick Bolter. Oh, yeah, yeah. I feel like you kind of have to go with that name. <laughs> I know. It's a great this name. Is, this is really great. Yeah, so, like, I think one of the things with character creation in Ross Raffles is, is this experience, kind of just learning about the war. Yeah, and learning yeah. about the actual people who fought in the war. Mm -hmm. This is great. Because almost almost every single playtest that I've done, everybody at the table pulls out their phone and starts reading about the war. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, this is really cool. So the questions are is like, uh, uh, yeah, the vaccinated. Uh, then there's like, do you understand the nature and terms of your engagement? Are you willing to be attested to serve in the Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force? Like, I like that that's an optional thing there. Yeah. What is your trade or calling? Farmer. Huh. That was a common one. That's a, that's that a was class. a common yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> well, my great grandfather, oh. the sheet says he was an adding machine mechanic. What is an adding oh. machine? I don't know. I think it might be like, it's like a, a super old school. Well, like they're yeah, huge. Like it's like a super old school like calculator. That, like I have to yeah. handle and like. That's all. Awesome. See, we're learning. I have to look this up. That now. really fits with the scrounger too. It, it, that really does. Born in, oh, yeah. This guy was born in England. Mm -hmm. Adding machine. Oh. Are you still reading? Whoa, that's oh, that's so Acton cool. Acton Green, Middlesex, England. Yeah, this is. Well, uh, oh, this person's that. from Cardiff. That's cool. That's cool. Living in Ontario. Yeah, this so is, a lot wow. of people who fought in the Canadian Expeditionary Force were actually born in um, Great Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were um, born in Great and Britain. then emigrated, or even in other countries in Europe as well. Yeah, 100%. like uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans. Yeah, and some of them were even treated as enemy aliens. Yeah, yeah. This is awesome. Yeah, it's like I, I love character Algernon. creation for this game. What a good name! Oh, yeah, oh, that's a great name, <laughs> Algernon. 
Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like One Shot. The most fun way to learn about new games is to play. On One Shot, you can discover the amazing variety in RPGs by listening to actual play. Every week, James D'Amato brings you a new episode with a talented cast of improvisers, game designers, and other notable nerds. At least once a month, One Shot features a new system exploring a wide variety of genres. The stories are self-contained, so you can jump in anywhere, and it's a great way to find your new favorite game. Discover the magic of RPGs with One Shot and your favorite podcast app.